All right, I think we'll get started. Can everybody hear okay? All right. My name is Liz Langdon Gray. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. It is wonderful to see all of you here today. Thank you for being here. A few logistical notes. The event is being recorded, so if you don't want to be on camera, please don't sit down in the front row, but we will be recording questions to the panelists at the end of the session. And if you could switch your phones off, that would be fantastic. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Francesca Domenici. Francesca is the faculty co-director, um, along with David Parks from Computer Science. Francesca is a professor of biostatistics at the School of um, Public Health and faculty co-director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. It's such a pleasure to work with her and David to get this initiative up and running and to do exciting events like this one where we're really bringing data science, um, uh, new perspectives from data science on really um, important questions. So please welcome Francesca. Thank you so much for coming and having a representation of faculty students from a um, whole different part of the university. So I'm just going to have some opening remarks and really provide a super brief overview of the Data Science Initiative and our commitment about using data, using science, and advancing women um, in, uh, in academia. So. Um, I think that just as a very broad view of the Harvard Data Science Initiative, we really work at the intersection of methodology and scientific inquiry. We are bringing faculty across all the different parts of Harvard, faculty and student and staff, mm -hmm. to really putting, uh, to really work together to address the most important question in society, ranging from infection disease forecasting to higher education financing design, to analysis of high dimensional data in astronomy and medicine to prediction of earthquake. And how our approach is really to have a broad leadership. I am so fortunate. I actually have the co-director with David Parks, who's a professor in computer science. Uh, and we have coming from two different disciplines, different campuses, and learning from each other every day. We have a two governance committee of faculty drawing members from across the university. And we have a lot of strategic, uh, structural, and programmatic events, especially investing resources into a new cohort of data science postdoctoral fellows that this is an international uh, competition and they come and they work with faculty across a different discipline as well as um, funding competitive research awards for, um, for our faculty and also monthly seminar. We also have research teams, which I'm going to talk to you a little, a, a, a little bit better. And then we're always externally focused to amplify impact. And today, we had really an opportunity to bring to bear and also, I would say, celebrate, I would say, what has been a really successful partnership with industry and in particular with Elsevier. So the relationship with Elsevier has been in the discussion for uh, quite some time. We are so thankful for their support. In uh, uh, November 2017, we had our first kickoff event where actually we brought together faculty across the university with Elsevier scientists to really think, and, and many of them are actually are here today in this room, uh, to really think about you know, you have to think that Elsevier has also positioned itself as a data science company and with an enormous amount of a data science analytic expertise. So what type of things we can work together? And so one of the, some, ge some general team was to think about key factor for scientific impact on policy, interpretable models for precision medicine, electronic medical record, and also social and behavioral de 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 determinants of healthcare. Uh, where do we stand with the Data Science Initiative? We, this is just a quick snapshot of how we are um, growing into Harvard and thinking about the Harvard Data Science Initiative as um, everyone is welcome to, to be part of the Data Science Initiative and how we are really thinking ourselves about a startup within Harvard that hopefully will become an institute. Uh, we are having, we are very open and very engaged to thinking about relationship with industry and industry seminars. As I said, we have fellows. We are managing um, and overseeing the launching and the implementation of three master programs in data science, um, and so a lot of faculty engaged. 
Um, as I said, in terms of research interests of faculty across the university, we have identified the following research teams uh, that span, as you can say, interests from the business school, the School of Art and Sciences, and the Kennedy School, the School of Medicine, the Public Health, uh, and also with a strong focus on met methodological advancement of analysis of data at the core of statistics, computer science, biostatistics, applied math. Now, in terms of gender uh, and career advancement of women, David and I have made a strong commitment that any, uh, you know, pretty much all our new recruits and all our funding are gender balanced. By gender balance, I mean 50-50. And in our postdoctoral fellows appointment, uh, you will see that to, these are the international competition that we have run. The first cohort were eight postdoctoral fellows. Uh, the second cohort were four postdoctoral fellow, and then we just recruited the last cohort of four. So uh, eight plus four plus four uh, is 16. Uh, we have <laughs> 16 postdoctoral fellows, of which 50% of postdoctoral cities eight women, uh, and so we are, I'm really, really proud of that. And similarly, we are very, very conscientious and committed in terms of funding for uh, our faculty members across the university, just to give you a snapshot of the research that we are, we are funding on different topics, ranging from uh, chemics to physics to medicine, um, and again, with a larger representation and gender, um, and gender balance. So I'm going to conclude here to the beginning of what I think is going to be a really exciting program and throughout the next hour and a half and talking about gender issues and how data can advance together with our friends from Helsevier. And let me turn it to Anne Gabriel for her remarks. And I'm not going to compete with that glare. I hope you can all hear me, though. And good afternoon, everyone. As Francesca noted, I'm Ann Gabriel, and I'm part of Elsevier's Global Strategic Networks team. Elsevier are pleased and proud to be affiliated with the Harvard Data Science Initiative and have collaborated on various programs and initiatives since it was announced just over two years ago in March of 2017. I'd like to personally thank HDSI co-chairs Francesca Dominici, David Parks, and Executive Director Elizabeth Langdon Gray for making this a particularly active and fruitful collaboration. Today's event, Representation in Academia, is a terrific example of how both Harvard and Elsevier are working together to progress the mutually shared objective of data-driven approaches to societal challenges. I've been at Elsevier for more than 15 years, and my work has always been at the nexus of scholarly communication and technology. We have made a lot of progress towards the acceleration of scientific discovery, and along the way, I have seen a lot of cultural change, both in academia and in publishing technology as well. However, certain developments really stand out, and here is one in particular. On January 28th of this year, Elsevier took a giant step forward when it announced the appointment of its first female CEO in its 140-year history, Kamsal Bayasit. <laughs> I'm taking the bow. How about that? <laughs> it is my privilege to be able to introduce her now so that she may share further both Elsevier and her personal commitment to establishing gender equity and delivering on a promise of diversity and inclusion and share how Elsevier in collaborations with its partners are using data to address this challenge. Now, I spent some time thinking about how to frame the introduction to Comsal, and I'm, I'm doing some research, and I came across this 2018 study in the Harvard Business Review, the different words we use to describe male and female leaders by Harvard colleagues David Smith, Judith, Judith Rosenstein, and Margaret Nikoloff. They analyzed a large-scale military data set of over 4,000 participants and 81,000 evaluations to examine objective and subjective performance measures that included a list of 89 positive and negative leadership attributes that were used to assess leader performance. Their research on leadership attitudes found significant differences in the assignment of 28 leadership attributes when applied to men and women. While the men were more often assigned attributes such as analytical, competent, athletic, and dependable, women were more often assigned compassionate, enthusiastic, energetic, and organized. On the negative side, and, and start counting on your fingers, women were more often evaluated as inept, 
frivolous, gossip, excitable, scattered, temperamental, panicky, and indecisive. That's eight if you were counting. While men were more often evaluated as arrogant and irresponsible. So the, my point here is words matter. Data on words matter. And here is a data-driven approach to describe the language of leadership. And choosing the right words to describe the impact Elsevier's new CEO will have is important. Those of us who have had the privilege of working with Kamsal can report she is indeed compassionate and enthusiastic. But like the other female leadership in this room, she is also unlimited and extremely, if not exceptionally, analytical, competent, and dependable. She is an example to all of us at Elsevier. And while I can't speak to her athleticism, I can share just a few more <laughs> details. Okay. So, so. Born and raised in Turkey, Kamsal joined Relix Group. El Elsevier's parent company in 2004 as part of the legal and risk business analytics where she had several senior strategy and operational roles. In 2012, she was appointed chief strategy officer of Relix Group with Elsevier as the group's largest business. Kamsal is also chair of Relix's chief technology officers forum created to foster strategic acceleration into an increasingly data-driven business with a focus on analytics and decision tools. As such, she is intimately familiar with the transition from digital reference to digital decision tools and the deployment of artificial intelligence technologies such as machine learning and natural language processing. Disciplines and technologies that spark Elsevier's strategic vision. For the past three years, Kamsal has been the regional president for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Relics Group's exhibitions business. Following her childhood in Turkey, Kamsal attended university in the United States. She holds an MBA 01 from Harvard Business School and is a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. Prior to joining Relix, Kamsal worked at Bain & Company in the US, South Africa, and Australia. Please join me in a warm welcome for Kamsal Bias at pioneering CEO of Elsevier, chair of the Relix Technology Forum, and a dedicated supporter of the Harvard community. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. <laughs> Well, thank you, Anne, for that incredible introduction. And I'm glad you didn't speak to my athleticism, because <laughs> I am what you may qualify as athletically challenged person. <laughs> well, good afternoon. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, and I am, it, it's my eighth week as the CEO of Alsevier. And I'm here uh, for a reason. This is a priority for me. Diversity and inclusion matters. And I very much look forward to working with the Harvard Data Institute so that we can have data-driven approaches to make progress in diversity and inclusion across the board in science and in the broader context. Um, what I wanted to do today is actually um, start with a bit of um, context. Over the next 50 years, if you look at the total workforce, the percentage of women went from 36% to 47 and the percentage of women in STEM went from 7% to 25%. The reason why I wanted to do this, and for those of you who read Factfulness, which is a wonderful book by Hans Rosling, is I'm going to be uh, focusing on a lot of things that's not working today, but I want to do that in a positive light, recognizing how much progress has been made, and we will continue to make progress. Uh, so before I, I focus on where we need to progress, I want to just recognize that we have made a lot of progress. And, um, I will, um, before I talk about what's not working, I also want to say I'm actually very grateful standing here today in front of you. Um, I'm very grateful to my grandmother, who was one of the first uh, Turkish female lawyers. They admitted three women into her class uh, when they opened law schools for, for women. She would have been 101 today, and she had been a huge influence on me. Um, I'm very, very grateful to a lot of the baby boomer generation men who have actually coached me and mentored me as I progressed in my career because there weren't that many ma uh, women around to actually uh, um, coach me and mentor me as I was coming up the ranks. Um, I am very grateful to Harvard, especially the woman I met while I was in business school. They have been my people, my tribe, my support system over the last 20 years. Uh, and I'm also very grateful to Harvard because I met my husband while I was in business school. We were <laughs> section mates. Um, he's French, and he has been brought up by a very strong French woman, a French teacher, um, who has taught him that in a marriage you share everything equally. And he has been an incredible partner for me, and he also is one of the best vacuum cleaners I know. So I'm, I'm very <laughs> grateful for him as well. So I just wanted to cover that before I go into 
my talk and talk about diversity and inclusion. Now, we all know that diversity matters. There are reams of research that shows that with diversity, you have less group think, you drive better customer outcomes, you drive better societal outcomes. Uh, this has all been proven over the last 10, 15 years due to wonderful research coming out of the communities. And that's really important. But what is more important is diversity and inclusion is the right thing to do. And I think that's what drives a lot of us who are in the room today. I would argue diversity matters even more in STEM. Um, if diversity is not factored into scientific and medical research, we are perpetuating barriers for women uh, to progress. And we're not producing the best research that we possibly can. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of barriers to work through. So if you look at this data that just came out of NIH, this is the funding that first-time principal investigators get uh, from NIH. The blue is male and orange is female. And you can see that there is a difference of about $40,000 for first-time grants as a median between male and female uh, grant um, seekers, the first-time principal investigators. Now, $40,000 arguably can make or break a project. It can make or break a career. And we have to address this. Um, diversity still also change, faces a lot of challenges in academia. And I want to share some of the findings of my um, Lancet team, which I'm very proud of. And I think you've seen the February issue we had outside. Please grab one. It's a wonderful issue. But what they have shared in that issue is that gender gaps in funding are due to, oh god, I don't have my glasses, so I'm going to have to read here. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do that sometimes. I'm still in denial that I do need glasses. <laughs> there you go. This is better. Um, gender gaps in funding are due to less favorable assessment of women, not their signs. Only one third of biomedical studies includes data on sex, restricting real world relevance of findings and pledges for gender and ethnic diversity at world's top universities are not driving the impact that we need. And then if you look at the chart on the right, I'm not sure if you can see the data, but it shows the career progression analysis of the top 15 US, UK, and Canada public health universities. Horizontal axis shows the seniority of the workforce, and the vertical shows the percentage of the workforce. The red line shows the data for non-ethnic minority women. Blue line shows the data for ethnic minority women. And you can see both of these lines go down as the positions get more senior. It's striking with a magnified disadvantage for minority ethnic women. Purple line depicts the non-ethnic minority men, and gray line depicts ethnic minority men. And differences in the curves are striking there as well. So the study revealed that clear gender and ethnic disparities remain at the most senior academic positions despite numerous diversity policies and action plans. So, and guess why Lancet is very good at driving all this research? So if you look at my Lancet team, you can see the senior leadership representation. So strategic leadership is three women, two men, editorial 15 women, four men, Lancet journals eight women, six men, <laughs> international advisory board 12 women, 12 men. This is where they have been able to achieve gender balance, and this is why they drive so much good work. Now, we all know the issues, and we don't always know the solutions. And this is where data science comes into play. As a female leader in business, I have worked very hard over the last decade, as I was in senior roles, to encourage, mentor, and promote women so we have more female leadership at Relix, which is the parent company for Elsevier. What I have found very hard to do is to find evidence on what works systematically. Here are some myths and solutions from the Lancet covered in their February issue. Myth number one, other people are biased, not me. Myth number two, the key to controlling bias is controlling how people think. <laughs> Myth number three, underrepresentation of women is a pipeline problem. 51% of Relix employees are, are actually female. Myth number four, promoting diversity contravenes mediocrity or meritocracy. <laughs> Myth number five, we have to fix the woman. And that's my favorite. <laughs> I tell the woman I support to ignore all the press they read about how they should behave differently. 
I tell them to be themselves, to be authentic. And very early on in my career, I was given the advice, I remember at a performance review, that I was too nice of a person to progress in my career. Uh, luckily, I had the wisdom not to, to listen to that advice, thanks to my grandmother, who would have turned 101. Solution number one, treat gender equality as an innovation challenge. We use a lot of data when we're trying to innovate. Solution number two, change institutional norms. Solution number three, create a culture in which people feel personally responsible for change. Solution number four, implement behavioral guidelines and action plans. Solution number five, create organizational accountability for change. I love what Professor Kank and Professor Kaplan wrote in their paper, Five Myths About Diversity and Inclusion Debunked with Evidence. They said, from implicit bias training to focusing on the pipeline problem, or the idea that we should fix women by teaching them negotiation or assertiveness skills, too many institutional policies are not supported by evidence. Focusing on the individual will not lead to progress. Instead, structural and systematic interventions are necessary to drive change. So how can we use data and evidence-based methodologies to understand what can drive better progress in diversity and inclusion in the scientific community and across the board? At Relex, a uh, parent company for Alsevier, we are very committed to diversity and inclusion and open to bringing our assets and expertise to bear to support progress. We have many partnerships, including the UN Global Impact, Global Research, Sustainable Development Goals, and Bloomberg Gender Equality. I'm proud of the work we have done and continue to do, and as an information analytics business, we play a role in providing evidence-based insight and guidance for intervention and policy. We published the gender um, in the Global Research Landscape Report, which I hope you were able to pick a copy of outside. We support the Gender Summit, whose aim is to make gender equality in research and innovation the norm. And we recognize the achievements of women in research and medicine through initiatives such as the Alsevier Foundation Awards and Research Excellence Awards. We also have a notable partnership with She Figures. Um, and the work we've done there, I, I think, is worth highlighting for a minute. She Figures was launched by the European Commission in 2003. And it investigates the level of progress made towards gender, and gender equality in research and innovation in Europe. It is the main source of pan-European comparable statistics on the representation of women and men among PhD graduates, researchers, and academic decision makers. And the data also sheds light on differences in the experiences of women and men working in research, such as relative pay, working conditions, success in obtaining research funds, and in scientific publication and inventorship. So we at Alsevier collaborate and, and provide data such as number of publications per gender, international collaborations, field-weighted citation index by gender, sex and gender dimension in research content, and trajectory of ownership rates during career development by gender and field of research and development. I firmly believe as these metrics are measured, we will find ways to improve that. We also have 30,000 people um, at Relix, and 8,000 of them are technologists, a quarter of them women, better than most technology firms, I would argue not good enough. 51% of our employees are women, again, not clearly enough in senior positions. But we have a capable, intellectually curious workforce committed to diversity and inclusion, and have expertise in leading data sets and how to manipulate leading data sets. So we can make a contribution. At Alsevier, we have the ability, working with our community, to drive progress in advancing the careers of female researchers. We formed a gender working group which helps ensure that we support the most re robust research possible in the most equitable and inclusive way. That transfers to initiatives like gender diversity on editorial boards. And we've done a lot of work, particularly in our earth and energy portfolio since 2016. And the number of female editors are moving in the right direction. We have been able to see increases across the board. Not as fast as I would like, but it proves that focus improves balance. We've also done work among speakers at Elsevier conferences. Um, only about 15% of our speakers were female when we first measured it. And over the last two years, we've been able to increase that percentage to 30%. And in eight of our conferences last year, we had a 50-50 split. 
And again, as Francesca always says, what you can measure, you can improve. And the gender balance metric is a key metric we use with our conference organizers, just like customer satisfaction and financial performance. And that has moved the needle. Um, we are also ready and willing to tackle challenging questions that is at the root of our partnership with the Harvard Data Science Initiative. We hope, to br we hope to drive progress in diversity and inclusion, leveraging our passion and commitment, our ability to drive an impact in the publishing process, which is critical for career progression, our unique and comprehensive data sets, and our 7,000 strong people at Elsevier, of whom 1,300 are technologists, with a quarter of them PhDs focused on artificial intelligence technologies, primarily in machine learning and natural language processing. So, in conclusion, we know the problems, we need solutions, we need policy, we need procedures, we need systematic changes we can implement to support women to progress in their careers on an even field. This is where I'm hopeful data science can help us understand and assess what works. Um, again, Francesca always says what you can measure, you can improve, and you can evolve, and that is what is needed to drive better diversity and inclusion. And I sincerely believe we can collectively make a difference here. And as an incoming uh, CEO of Alsevier, this will be a top priority cause for me during my tenure. I also want to tell you a story at the end to sort of wrap up my comments. And I thought about whether I should tell the story because I appreciate it's a data science gathering and this is about the spiritualist. But I decided even though it may impact my credibility, I'll share the story. I was in an Oprah Winfrey cruise a couple months ago with four of my girlfriends. Uh, there were 2,750 women on board and 75 men. Um, it was a three-day cruise to the Caribbean. I do this with my girlfriends every year. We do something different. And actually, one of them is the CEO of Princess Cruises, and she had organized this. And she was telling me about a retreat she had in LA in a high-end retreat place uh, over the weekend. And she went with her husband, and she signed up for all the classes. And one of them was a spiritualist. And the spiritualist said, for the last 15,000 years, the universe has been dominated by male energy. At the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, a shift has started. <laughs> <laughs> for the next 15,000 years, the universe <laughs> will be dominated by female energy, and the planet will heal. I'm, I'm sharing this story because of actually my daughter's reaction to it, who's 11 years old. So I went back home to London. I told her so, this story because I thought it was really amusing. And I thought she would laugh just like you did. She looked at me very seriously and she said, Mommy, that's not good. We don't want the boys to feel like we do. So I'm still thinking through that. And I'd like you to pontificate on that. Uh, and thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kamsal, for your opening remarks, which broadly outlined some of the key ways in which we're working together and using data, not just for the sake of data itself, but to inform cha and change practices related to representation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Holly Falk Krasinski, Vice President, Research Intelligence in, global, in the Global Strategic Networks team at Elsevier, where her responsibilities center on how to draw insights from data, metrics, and analytics, and also guide strategic planning for research funding and policy organizations. Holly's engagement activities emphasize building partnerships around topics such as research metrics and evaluating research performance, interdisciplinary research and scientific collaboration, economic development and innovation, gender equality in STEM, and open science. Holly is also broadly involved in promoting early career researchers and women leaders serving on the NIH's best program external scientific panel, co-chair of Elsevier's Gender Working group and a former editor-in-chief of AWIS magazine and also a cover girl fe <laughs> featured after the re release of the gender report. Prior to joining Elsevier, Holly was a faculty member and administrator at Northwestern University where she launched the Office of Research Development and facilitated a multitude of trans-institutional collaborative grant programs with a special interest in approaches to evaluating collaboration, team science leadership, and research networking. Holly is a friend, colleague, and in the words of many who know her well, a force of nature. She spearheaded the development of our Gender in the Research Landscape Report and the background of 
results of which she will share briefly with you now. The byline for this report within Elsevier is it's the gift that keeps on giving in that it continues to spark discussion and engagement and a forward-looking agenda for continued research in the area. Take it away, Holly. The, oh, the light will turn green and you'll hear me. All right, this is fantastic. But here's what I know. My hair is going to block more of the screen than I want, so I'm going <laughs> to try to make this work. Uh, well, yeah, I was going to really block out like a quarter, and this is a good calm hair day. So thank you so much. So in case it wasn't stressful enough to follow Anne, who's my line manager, Kumsal, who's our CEO, I now have to follow the wisdom of Kumsal's 11-year-old daughter, and I'm now really nervous about that. So um, I, hopefully, hopefully I can bring us all to the same level of, of thought um, as your daughter has Kumsal. Um, so as already been alluded to, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about our actual gender in the Global Research Landscape Report. If you haven't picked up a copy outside to follow along, please grab one or at least grab one on your way out. This is my beautifully used copy with all kinds of, of notes in it. Um, this report, which spans 20 years, 12 geographies, and 27 disciplines, is an evidence-based examination of the global research landscape through a gender lens. For me, I'm very proud because it's an example of Elsevier's commitment toward data-driven understanding of the role of gender within the global research enterprise, a component of our overall diversity and inclusion initiative. But why did we do it? And the answer is not because Holly asked us to, although that was an answer for a little while, but more importantly because it was an opportunity for Elsevier to answer a call for data. So I'm showing a couple of examples up here at the National Science Foundation, current director France Cordova had put into a piece about intentional equity and talking about the NSF's role to continue advancing equity through data-driven decision making but also within the article talked about a dearth of data that's been available. And I'm also showing you here a quote from a report by uh, Morgan Stanley in looking at women in the corporate sector, and they noted that quantitative gender diversity data generally lag behind qualitative data points. But here it was, it was now at a company that had lots of quantitative data and an opportunity for us to receive and answer that call for data. And we can do that because, in fact, we have outstanding information analytics expertise at Elsevier, notably within our analytical services team, uh, which is led by my colleague um, Maria DeKlein. And um, analytical services provides accurate and unbiased analysis on research performance by combining high-quality data sources with technical and research metrics expertise that have been accrued over our long history at Elsevier. The analytics team, of whom some of my colleagues like Bomini, who is here, and uh, Tom and Data Science, um, it, they have a lot of experience in serving policymakers, funders, and academic and corporate research institutions around the world. So our offers range from very simple targeted reports to comprehensive multidimensional studies, of which uh, we've already pointed to the she figures. This is our original gender report, uh, mapping gender in the German um, environment. You can get copies of that online as well. So what we understood is that critical issues related to gender disparity and bias must be examined by sound studies and supported by data. So our analytics report aimed to provide powerful evidence-based insight and guidance for intervention and policy development related to gender equality and gender research for governments, funders, and institutions worldwide. All right, here comes the tricky part of the presentation. I have to explain our entire disambiguation, genderizing methodology in one minute and one slide. Here it goes. Uh, so the data sources that we use throughout, and I promise you there's an appendix and you can get all of the detail you want and I can answer questions later. Um, so we primarily for our study use our Scopus database. Scopus is the world's largest abstract and citation database of peer-reviewed literature, almost at 7 million, uh, 75 million articles. I think next week they'll hit 75. Scopus coverage is global and that was very important to us. Um, titles from all geographies around the globe, including non-English uh, titles. In fact, approximately 21% of the titles in Scopus are from non-English journals. In addition, Scopus offers broad range of peer-reviewed literature and quality web sources across science, technology, engineering, and medicine, as well as social sciences, arts, and humanities. And it was very important for us to be able to think across the entire uh, breadth of the knowledge domains. For each author that's listed in our Scopus database, they have been given a unique identifier through which we can identify all of that uh, researcher's publications, their affiliations, and citations um, into a single profile. 
We then use a couple of other resources, Genderize.io and NameSource, so these are social media based resources um, uh, that provide for each country a list of first names and the number of people with the first name being a man and being a woman. Now country of origin matters because for example if your first name is Michelle and you were born in the United States there's a high likelihood that you're a woman. However if your first name is Michelle and you were born in France there's a high likelihood that you are a man. So we use this information combined of Scopus, author ident uh, identification and first names and country of origin to calculate the probability that first name is masculine or feminine and then all Scopus author profiles are matched to this data set according to the country of origin. If the first name appears at least five times in the data and with more than 85% probability that the first name is a masculine or feminine name, we can assign the gender associated with that first name to the researcher, to the Scopus author profile. So we do that on the, the level of individual profiles and then we do the analysis on an aggregate level. And so what I'm going to show you now are some of those aggregate analyses. All right, so our report importantly starts with an evidence-informed um, introduction, and at the end I'll tell you where you can in fact find all the references that we included in the report. And then we have a series of data, uh, data chapters, one on research performance, looking at outputs, quality, and impact through a gender lens. Then we looked at the social aspects of research, including leadership, collaboration, and mobility. And then our last, uh, uh, last chapter is about published gender research as a discipline. But importantly, combining that kind of qualitative data, uh, quantitative data is insufficient. We combine it with qualitative insight from experts around the globe to help us provide context for the information and the findings within our report. All right, so um, I'm going to show with you now the key findings of the report focused on the United States because I'm pretty certain most everybody here is, is US oriented. Um, so importantly, our data found that the proportion of women among researchers in the US is at about 40%. And this was up from an earlier time period. This was at, um, up through 2015. This is similar to other major developed nations um, or geographies such as the European Union, UK, France, and Denmark. Among researchers, women tend to specialize in the life and the health sciences. You may already be uh, familiar with that on an anecdotal scale. We were able to demonstrate it through the data. In fact, we were able to show that men tend to specialize in the technical fields. While women tend to publish slightly fewer papers than men on average across the United States, we find that citation and download impact, so two indicators of performance and output, are slightly higher for women than they are for men. So perhaps volume a little bit lower, but impact a bit higher. And although the proportion of women among inventors in the U.S. is at 14%, we know that in the most recent time period, 23% of patent applications list a woman among their authors. It was important for us to look at different stages across the workflow of research, at the earliest stages of when new research and new information is discovered, and as it moves towards an application of that. In the U.S., women seem to collaborate internationally less than men on papers, and we found that actually in the U.S., we performed almost as poorly as women in Japan, which um, if you look at our report, Japan is the place where women um, really have it difficult among other um, uh, countries around the world. Women seem to collaborate across the academic and corporate sectors on papers at a similar rate to men in the U.S., which wasn't so for all countries, uh, but there were lots of room for improvement because the U.S. overall were only at about 5% of our collaboration. Uh, is academic corporate, so cross-sector, so lots of grand opportunity. And then finally, in the U.S., 8% of women's scholarly output belongs to about the 10, top 10% 10 of it interdisciplinary papers, another important indicator of performance and quality, and one in which we find that there was a, a big difference between men and women as well. So let me dive in a little bit to a bit of the, uh, of the findings in some more detail. Throughout the next set of slides that I'm going to show some important things for you to keep track of. If you see it in purple, that represents uh, women and green is men. We worked really hard to do away with the pink and blue. Just couldn't watch a whole report in pink and blue. Um, you'll see these are all of the countries. Here's the United States that I have. And when we're talking about researchers, we're talking about researchers who are authors, or in some cases are also inventors, who have published articles, reviews, and conference proceedings, or who have patent applications. So that's the, the key for you. Let me show you some of the other studies. So this is the proportion and number of US researchers by gender and by subject area. And one of the unique features of our report is that we were able to do it across 27 subject areas. So we see that there, while there's a lower proportion of women among researchers for most comparators, um, there were really low proportions for some of these um, engineering, uh, natural or physical sciences um, areas, such as engineering, um, energy, math, and physics and astronomy. 
Um, but there are majority of researchers in some fields, such as nursing and psychology. We weren't at all surprised to see this because we know also in a clinical sense that there are more women than there are men. Um, and there are some fields where women comprise nearly half of the researchers. So this is in the social sciences, veterinary sciences, medicine, health professions, and arts and humanities as well. Now what we saw is that this isn't the same in all countries around the world and the proportions and the different ways in which women are represented across fields changes. And I think that's something very important for us to keep in mind, that it's not all the same everywhere around the world, and it's certainly not all of the same across disciplines. So as we're thinking about that, we don't want to look at one problem as if gender equality is all the same problem everywhere. We actually have to be able to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so looking at the issues of citation impact, uh, what we saw is that in the United States was the only comparator in which the field-weighted citation impact, which trust me on this, is a normalized indicator of the impact of publications, um, for women is higher than for men. It was the only country, so it was really exciting about that. There's equality across the UK and European Union as well, um, and then there are other countries where women showed a slightly lower impact than for men in those countries. Again, seeing that there are differences between fields and across geographies as well. Thinking about now some of the social aspects of research, because of course we don't do research in isolation, um, and even if we don't happen to like people, that wasn't my problem in science, but uh, even if you don't happen to, you probably have to work with other people. So we wanted to look at some of those social aspects. Oh, weird things happened there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, I'll try to, yeah, sorry about that. You can't see the first paragraph. Um, but we looked at uh, one important um, category of leadership is the position and author byline for articles. Um, and tendency for a lot of the STEM fields is the first and last author or first and corresponding author tend to have important meanings for a team. So we looked at first and corresponding authorship and, and we just used the case study of engineering. This is a field where women are underrepresented compared to men. And we wanted to understand something about their leadership role is it that women have lower leadership roles because they're represented? Or is it better if they are engaged in engineering research? Do they have more leadership opportunities? I'm afraid that's not the case. In, in this report, uh, we saw that engineering is a field where women researchers are generally significantly outnumbered by men. Men appear as authors in engineering papers. They are more likely to take the first or corresponding author position. So essentially adding insult to injury. Women are first or corresponding author on 43% of their own engineering papers, 20 percentage points less than men. So not only did it move, oh, not only did it, not only is there an underrepresentation, and so this talks about these issues of pipeline, but an underrepresentation at leadership levels when otherwise it looks like there should be an even playing field, which suggests that there's more at play than simply pipeline. All right, looking at international collaboration, which is also an important um, indicator of performance worldwide. Um, in international collaboration, it's indicated by papers where the authors um, have affiliations across two different countries. The US has relatively low shares of these kinds of papers across the board, both men and women. Um, but for women, even less than men. Um, in part, it's because of the nature of our own geography. It's really easy to stay within the United States and continue to work with people. Um, in line with global patterns, scholarly output that reflects international collaboration increased, um, and it did so for both men and women, so no significant difference there. Um, women's scholarly output is li less likely, though, to result from international collaboration than men, even when there seem to be equal numbers of men and women engaging, less of their output is through international collaboration. And what we think is that that may reduce opportunities and for people to be making uh, recommendations. And it's just advancing all by itself. Um, and I don't know. It needs to, it knows it's all done. So importantly, after we had all of this, one of the things we did is wanted to take our own lesson. We have data, so we're using data. We created a tool for all of our publishers and editors in chief using all of this data that was in the report as well as others that we weren't able to publish in the full report um, so that all of these folks have the opportunity to use data to drive discussions and to set targets within their own editorial boards around the proportion of men and women. This has helped considerably because in some of our journals, it was very difficult to broach the subject of better gender balance and having data and presenting data to scientists and engineers was a great way to start the conversation. In the end, let me just tell you where you can get all of these materials. You can download the report and the related infographic. It's all free. You can have access to the report's data. So if you wanted to do some of your own analyses, all of the data that we used as part of the report is publicly available. 
All of the references are also available in a public Mendeley group, which is now a community resource to which all of you can gain access and all of you can continue to add to. And importantly, then we also have a gender and resource center that's up online. So I know we have to get to the panel now, but I'm very happy to tell you that importantly, we've just launched the planning for our next gender report, which we're lovingly either calling Gender Report 2020 or version 2.0. It um, gives you an idea of the kinds of topics that we're going to be focused on in the next, uh, thinking about the participation at research at multiple stages, the process of science, and also investigating further career progression. So we're excited about being here uh, for today to help gain some insight and uh, guidance on how we'll develop out that report further. I'm happy to answer any questions um, in between breaks or after the session is over. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Now I'd like to call the panel to the stage. Our moderator, Francesca Dominici, Harvard University Clarence James Gamble Professor of Biostatistics, Population and Data Science, and co-director of the Data Science Initiative. She will be joined by Kamsal Bayezid, Elsevier Chief Executive Officer and Chair of the Relics Technology Forum. Also, Jesse Diaro, since 2007, Program Director for the National Science Foundation Advanced Program. Sharon Lees Norman, Professor Sharon Lees Norman, Professor of Healthcare Policy, Biostatistics in the Department of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School and in the Department of Biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health, as well as Kathleen McGinn, Harvard University, Connors Robb, Professor of Business Administration, Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Strategy and Recruiting, and Leslie Thompson, Elsevier's Vice President of Academic and Government Strategic Alliances. So I'm going to let you get to the panel. I have all your CVs here. I'll read them out loud to you afterwards. They're just too comprehensive and too impressive to get into now. <laughs> Thank you, Han. All right. Wow, there is a lot of female energy here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually kind of scared <laughs> and intimidated. <laughs> Great. So, well, first of all, also I want to thank Holly. This was a phenomenal presentation and a super fast and comprehensive and straight to the point, impressive overview of data. So I wanted to, I, I feel so uh, fortunate to really have all of this female leadership and energy around. And I wanted to really get their own personal opinion and thoughts. So I'm going to start and I'm, I'm going to do like in high school teacher, maybe I can impersonate your grandma from Turkey. <laughs> I had an under one year grandma from Italy, but I'm gonna start picking up people and asking questions. So I wanted to turn the first question to um, a lot of, uh, I would like to, to turn the first question to Sharon Lees and Leslie that have enormous amount of expertise and thinking about data, right? So one of the team about the, the workshop and the entire event is about what you can measure, you can change. And I think it's always going back, I think something can tell you said that whenever we are thinking about innovation, we are not scared to look at genomics data. So I don't see why we can look at data and talk about this important issue. So a question, and maybe Sharon, you can start with that then turn it to Leslie, is what type of data and summary do you think that we need to have and both having and trackings to make a transformational impact about these now well-documented challenges that the women face in academia. Sharon, what do you think? So what kind of data? data. Oh, so what kind of data do we need? Yeah. Uh, well, I think data like that in the report. Um, I think that at least in terms of, um, I think, let me talk about academia. In academia, uh, there are, are uh, a lot of meetings for uh, career advancement and promotion. There are meetings regarding, you know, your CV, et cetera. I think having more information collected on how frequently those meetings occur, uh, who's giving um, the advice, who's the mentors, uh, sort of how there are, you know, what, what are the types of questions that are, are discussed? What type of promotional opportunities are presented uh, to the faculty members? You know, for example, uh, promoting faculty members to present uh, at scientific uh, presentations. I think having information of how that process is moved along in someone's career is really important. I believe that currently, at least speaking 
as, as from my position uh, in terms of a faculty member. Um, you know, you check boxes, uh, but understanding really the content and, and how that is done in order to effectively see how someone is moving is, is really key. So that's just one type of thing. I th so I think in a job setting, uh, understanding and documenting, you know, here's how often this happened, here's how often um, male professor A was uh, promoted to, to speak here versus, you know, female professor B, et cetera. So yep. those are just some initial, initial thoughts. Okay, so I've actually seen data make a real difference in three examples. In the UK's Royal Society of London, where they started collecting data and then could show really clearly that some funding schemes, specifically targeting returners to work, were the most competitive amongst their suite. But everyone thought that was not quite such a prestigious fellowship to get. I've seen it happen in the UK funding agencies. I used to work in the UK funding agencies, where once we got the data, it became quite apparent for some very big chunks of funding, we just weren't supporting female PIs. Um, and I've seen it happen most recently in the UK with the published gender pay gap for UK universities. Um, I would say in every case I've been involved in, being clear on definitions and agreeing standards before you collect data is really important. To be systematic on data collection but also to assign value to the collector. I think that's really important. Those people who go around and collect this data are the holy saints of this issue, <laughs> and they are always <laughs> undervalued, um, and the openness of data. So I won't tell you how many universities in the UK will talk about data with me, but they won't publish it with each other. And you're just seeing that with the gender pay data in the UK now. Each university is making comments, justifying their performance. Um, I think data starts the discussion. It's never the end of the discussion. And my final observation is we should never wait till we get perfection in the data set we're trying to get before we start publishing the data because actually making a start just moves you in the right direction. I could point to all sorts of data, but actually all of you will know what influences your decision making, therefore what data you might want to have access to in this issue. Thank you. Anyone would like to add anything? No? Right. Uh, Kunsal, I'm going to turn it to you as um, eight weeks old CEO of the largest uh, company in terms of having the largest, I oh, hope I'm going to say this right, the largest collection of peer-reviewed publication. I was start thinking about the number, Holly, you said 75 million. So, um, so I thought that was a, this was an appropriate question for you. Um, so how having access to symptomatic data um, can accelerate the pace on which we can eliminate uh, gender differences in academic uh, success. And you know, what type of data, what type of critical data set do you think that can be extracted from this wealth of information to really move, the, you know, move forward the agenda of career advancement? And I think the gender report is one example, but what would be other examples? Um, I think data, as you know, is the starting point, as Leslie said, and we shouldn't wait for perfect data. And you've seen how much work Holly had to put in right. just to understand who was male or female in the Scopus database. So just having the data doesn't mean we can actually do the analysis. There is a lot of work that needs to be done to structure and unstructured, structure unstructured data, refine the data. Uh, extract entities from the data, create attributes, link them. So it's, it's a big undertaking. So I think it's important to start asking the questions yeah. to say what do you want to impact. I think honestly there is enough evidence that we know that diversity and inclusion is not where it needs to be. So what we have to do now is start peeling the onion. And I think we need to ask questions 
equally about what works versus what doesn't work. So if you looked at some of the data that Holly showed you, Portugal and Brazil have 50% female researchers, so they have actually the best gender equality amongst all the countries that we analyzed. Why is that? So this is where you can start peeling the onion to understand what are all the data sets that we can collect in Portugal and Brazil and compare and contrast with other countries. Now, I grew up in Turkey. This is a hypothesis, not a fact. But when I graduated from high school, uh, engineering and medical school intake for Turkish universities were 50% female, 50% male. That has unfortunately actually changed in the opposite direction since I graduated from high school. And I don't know why that is, but my hypothesis always was in the Turkish education system when I was in high school, um, you, didn't, you weren't actually allowed to have electives. So all the girls had to take all the sciences. So I had to take physics, chemistry, biology, maths. And I thought maybe that was the reason. So that's a policy decision in education. Um, so I think going back to your question, Francesca, we need to start with asking the questions to say, how can we learn from places like Brazil and Portugal? Why is it that India and Russia produces more computer scientists who are female than other countries? And now start collecting the data around education background, policy, funding, and figure out what are the drivers of this to see what, how we can replicate what works. That's, that's great. Um, so I'm going to turn into to ask a question to Jesse. So Jesse, you have an incredible and I would say potential really impactful role as um, overseeing the advanced program at NSF. And we are all collectively so grateful for the National Science Foundation, National Science Foundation to really think about critically about these issues. So, so I think that in a, in a perfect world, um, let's say that there are any faculty hiring committee or departmental chairs or editorial boards that are coming together and making decisions. And if they will be in a, this ideal world, well, there will be a dashboard where they can just, you know, like the, the people on the Weather Channel, they click and, and get data, right? What type of data you think, and what has been your experience by, by overseeing the program? What, what, what type of data really made a change? What type of data actually didn't make? It's also important to know what things that didn't work. And what would be the, the wonderful opportunity for, for leaders in academia? What type of data they could have in their, in their fingertips uh, so they can really make sure that there is a, the right incentive and advancement to women in, in, in academia? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so with advance, um, we have found that, that um, forcing is not the right word, but encouraging <laughs> our grantees to collect a lot of data about their faculty. Um, resulted in change um, at those institutions. Um, and that wasn't necessarily the design of, of advance from the beginning, but it's one of the things we've learned over time and incorporated it more into the design uh, more purposefully now. Um, and that data it, it keeps basically allows uh, the institutions to um, understand where there might be equity issues for their faculty, um, whether it's gender-based or race and ethnicity or otherwise um, based. Um, uh, for, for their faculty. Um, and so that has been powerful, that quantitative information about the individuals. But I think the advances also learn that there's a whole realm of qualitative information that also needs to be collected on a regular basis and analyzed um, to identify where there might be perception issues, there might be um, issues with feeling included, feeling welcomed, that actually impact things like uh, productivity um, impact things like intention to stay in job um, and, and um, their, their interest in persevering through to tenure, et cetera, instead of going into a different position. Um, you know, those, those perceptions, the feeling, the climate and culture um, indicators, which are not necessarily things you can count easily, right. um, are also very important to provide a greater context to those things you can count. Um, because a lot of the systemic issues that you would want to address are going to be found in the climate and culture issues, um, not just in the right. salary gaps and right. time and tenure um, differentials, et cetera. It's, there's issues there, but many of them will end up being rooted in right. climate and culture. So you have to collect both kinds of data um, at, the, at the institutional level, department I'd, level, et cetera. 
I have a follow-up question and a curiosity is um, to your experience it has been observed and documented that then then you have academic institutions that collect data and they've been seeing a progress and then when they stop are looking at the data and stopping and monitoring these indicator whatever are you know the quality the indicator the quantity they are sliding back uh, has been evidence of that or is this, you know we kind of think that would be the case but I was wondering whether that's that's or like there are some quality indicator quantitative indicator that as you start tracking them and achieving gender equity towards indicator then they lead to sustainable change and I think that's also important thing to know what are the data summary that lead to sustainable change and data summary that they don't okay so I don't think that we, I, we have any I have any examples of of um, sliding back due to um, stopping collecting the data um, uh, but we do know that um, only, which is still a good, a good rate, 65% of our institutional transformation grants maintain some portion of the activities they started with their advance grant. Mm -hmm. um, it, many of, some of, the first cohort is now 15 years later, still doing things after the advance grant related to what they first initiated. So in some sense, they have sustained those activities. So we have not had yet the opportunity to look at the other 35% that we're not able to to find out why, um, but I think that things like not collecting data and not creating infrastructure within the institution to monitor that data right. over time um, and to continually get the qualitative information about the the, uh, the from their workforce from their academic workforce um, without somebody being responsible for that, um, it it will just go away. Right. So um, you know, there's there's. It, it does, you, do need, you need infrastructure and you need to collect the data, but you also need people to look at the data right. and to understand it and to, to evaluate it because you might have emerging issues that you didn't have 10 years ago that are now impacting your new recruits um, right. into the academics um, and that you need to keep on it. So you need to have both the data and the people to monitor it. Yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you. So just. Thinking about and start talking about long-term solution, and I want to turn to, to um, Kathleen uh, as a professor from the business school. So, uh, Kathleen, what's your opinion and what are your thoughts? So, if we wanted to really thinking about data, data science uh, to lead to long-term sustainable solution, how that will look like? And I know I'm asking a very hard question, by the way, but you know, that's, that's why we're here, right? I'm happy to give you my wish list. Uh, yes. so, um, so we are currently trying to both grow the fi faculty and simultaneously increase the gender, race, and ethnicity diversity in the faculty. And as dean of strategy, faculty strategy and recruiting, you look at that and you go, how the heck do you do this? So you can think about it along levels. So what seems like a quick and dirty is to basically go out and hire senior faculty. So we call this the beg, borrow, and steal approach, right? <laughs> you, you go out, you identify the very, very few senior women, men of color, et cetera, who, who haven't already moved four times in their career and are willing to think about moving to us, and then you either borrow them or steal them. Um, and, and that only matters in the larger scheme of things, if you've created a better match. So, so the data that helps there is to identify folks whose um, productivity, for whatever reason, has peaked or slowed down. And you say, and those seem like the people, oh my gosh, you would never hire that person. And yet, that's the person you say, something's not working in the same way it used to be working. Maybe we can facilitate a better match. But those data are really, really hard to get. So then you say, okay, let's go to the junior laterals. Junior laterals look easier. First of all, there's lots more of them. Um, there's greater diversity in junior laterals. Um, and there's a few, you can also improve match there, so that's an important thing to be looking for. But there's some data there that would be really helpful that I have never seen, and that is, it would be nice to know what the network of um, scholars are around a person vis-a-vis -vis any in given individual scholarship. So Judy, 
and her team have put this together at Harvard. But this would be nice to see the world that way, right? So, so if I'm going to look at a certain junior scholar, if that scholar is embedded within essentially the perfect network, there's no point in me even trying to steal. The person probably won't want to come. And second of all, it would be um, efficiency reducing. Right? I want to increase efficiency across the academics, not decrease it. So I want to find somebody for whom our setting is uniquely, or at least a little bit, better in terms of the network of scholars around. So that would be helpful. And then in terms of rookies, um, economists have this wonderful rookie market that's very, very centralized. So you essentially can look at all the economists who are out in the market. The rest of the field's much, much less so. It's very hard to find out who's on the market. And in fact, it becomes um, a network in the negative sense, right? It's sort of who you know, you talk to the scholars you know, and you, I mean, we're already getting letters from our colleagues, our old doctoral students telling us about their doctoral students. And that's how we end up hiring. So it, all the top schools hire from all their friends at the other top schools. And it cannot be that those are the best scholars in the world 100% of the time, right? But, but we simply don't know how to find those rookies. So, so that data would be helpful. It would also be really helpful to see who's not going on the academic job market. And to try to figure out why that's so. Um, we know that women in um, STEM tend to go less on the academic job market than their male doctoral student colleagues. And if we could identify them ahead of time, here are some folks who look like they're not going to go on the academic market. Maybe we could figure out why and bring them in. And finally, who didn't get offers? So these are people that don't advertise themselves. And, and yet, there's often just, they just need a little bit of bump. And schools like HBS have plenty of resources to bring them in for a year or two of a postdoc program. Again, surround them with a network that can really facilitate the growth of their research. And even if we don't hire them, um, bounce them off to a much more productive career than they would have if they simply said, well, I didn't get a job, I'm gonna go sort of to some place where I'm gonna have to do a bunch of work and it's not related to my research. So, for example, a heavy teaching postdoc, um, which will almost guarantee that they no longer can build up their research. And finally, it would, grad schools matter. Like, who, who's going to grad schools? How can we drive greater entry into the grad schools that are training the excellent scholars? How do we diversify across the set of schools that pull people into our graduate programs? Our PhD programs are, are, are really almost embarrassingly populated by people from Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Brown. And, and again, those can't be 100% um, of the very, very top minds in the world, and yet we don't have access to who those people might be. So again, who gets in and who drops out? So who, who's dropping out from our grad programs and when and where might we intervene? So those would be yes. helpful data. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a follow-up question, uh, thought, and that is um, what defines success? for women in academics. And you know, we, we can sort of think of things off the top of our heads in terms of grants and things like that, but have we looked at how those metrics arose, uh, understanding the mechanism that places people in uh, those successful roles? Uh, you know, again, we all have our own stories about, okay, you know, grants and somebody else is the PI, but I'm not getting, you know, you know, we have grants, we've got publications, we've got uh, teaching. Are the success metrics that we currently have the right metrics? Now, maybe that's a, you know, a broader question for everybody, but, and moreover, the, uh, do the metrics that we have currently, I know I'm asking questions and <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm taking yeah. Francesca's role, but, um, and, and the ones that we do have, are they more likely to be realized by men versus women? Um, and so I, I just sort yeah. of pose that question. Yeah. Can I actually answer, given that you're taking my, taking my role? Can I answer to your question? <laughs> 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 Francesca. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I mean, one, I mean, this is just, just one idea, and this is something that's been a little bit my own, uh, my own advocacy. But it seems to me that when you're thinking about career advancement and success, we're always looking at the same metric, right? Publication, right? I think that it's time 
to put at the table to look at concrete measures of commitment toward diversity. And there are concrete measures that we, we can measure. I mean, I think I found, I think right now, when, when there is a choice of whether or not, even to promote a full professor, but to promote or appoint a chair of the department, appointment dean, a president, a provost, a CEO. And maybe in the corporate world that's, that's done, but I think in the academic world, I think that just looking at the metric in terms of what this person has done throughout the career, to thinking about diversity, not only in gender, but among racial and many other cultural and religious and sexual and so on. So anyway, can I have the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of, <laughs> so, I, but I anyone think, else would like to consult? Yeah, I think you raise a very, um, I think no, you have I've got one. I think I've got the wrong, some of us went wrong here. <laughs> but we're good at sharing. <laughs> No, but you raise a very good question around, are we measuring the right things and do we have the right metrics? And I think given that we are not making the progress we want to around diversity and inclusion, it is worthwhile visiting those and say, is career progression and uh, uh, the right to progress in your career measured with the right metrics in academia? Do you add other metrics in there that actually covers things outside of your research? I don't know if you, you would know better than I do, but I do feel it's time to step back and say, um, we need to probably introduce different metrics and different measurements into the equation, if only for nothing else but to test mm -hmm. whether they are driving a different outcome so we can actually um, uh, tinker with those and evolve them over time. Um, can I add, um, along these lines, one of our um, advanced grantees um, is actually doing this kind of thing with their project. They're, they're a, a, a Jesuit institution, Seattle University, and they're actually looking at <clears throat> how they have been led down a path of rewarding um, things that are not in line with their actual values of the institution, so that they have been <clears throat> recognizing um, research productivity, the standard things that other institutions have, but they have left behind what they were committed to, which was education and um, community, et cetera. Um, so they're trying to realign their tenure and promotion um, expectations to be more reflective of their mission as an institution, um, but still be in the, the realm of doing research and contributing in, in science and engineering, et cetera. So I, I do think that your question right. is, point, is right on. Um, we have hundreds of years of rewarding a certain type of scientist or engineer and what, they, what we're expecting them to do. Um, and it's gonna take a, a little bit of effort to, to switch that to make the definition of excellence broader, to include the teaching, the mentoring, the things that we actually need to do as a teaching institution, you know, that's the core of why we're all here, um, is to teach um, and do, and then the research is, is a way to teach. Right. Um, so how, we have to think about uh, what is it that we're rewarding? And I have to um, admit that I'm from the funding agency, which may have helped to move attention to the things where, where the dollars are, um, which is the research. Um, but that, that's an unintended, consequence of the what the structure that we've had um, that I think does need to be reevaluated. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, two more questions and then I want to open to 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 the for discussion and I'm gonna ask Leslie to comment on that and also Sharon Lee's um, what has been your personal experience about success stories? Okay. So I want to build on some of the conversation sure. we've just had. Um, so I'll give an example because I think names help sometimes. Um, a few years ago when I worked for a funder, we had a very fortunate windfall. So we decided to put money into something that was very speculative. Um, and that meant Oxford, who was one of the successful winning organizations, didn't have its usual nine months to pick its PhD students. It did it over the summer. And it recruited 10 students in one go to work in a cohort on a PhD. Those students were the most diverse students they've ever had. And if you look at where they are now, it's extraordinary. Um, and there was something about an opportunity in the summer when people were maybe on vacation that people who were working or were doing different things looked and saw it and took it on. 
So I think there are things we can do around the normal processes to really throw a bit of a spoke in the wheels. It was high risk. They did it because a funder came along with money. But actually, as a funder, I didn't mind doing high risk things if it changed the game. Um, so that's one example. I think in the UK, um, we've had for some time things like Athena Swan or Juno in physics to try and um, kite mark departments or universities. Um, that really wasn't very successful until a very brave funder, um, and she is very brave, announced that if you did not get Athena Swan Silver, which is the mid-range award, you would not be eligible for research grants from 2017. I have never seen such a rush to qualification. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the integral desire, but actually money, and if you were going to lose out on money, everyone rushed. Um, and so I think sometimes you can adjust criteria to try and encourage and nudge behavior. I've seen that time and time again. And the real question is, um, and this is a really unusual audience for me, you're amazingly towards one gender. Um, <laughs> um, what are the things that would nudge women that are starting out now in science to take more opportunities to have a really successful career in research? Because I think that's something that all of you can contribute to the conversation in, rather than somebody who's been around the block, is looking at the end of the, tele of the telescope, thinking what I might think would work. It's really important that we let you all find your voice on what would make a difference to you having a really successful career in research. And that's really what the advanced world needs, given the problems facing the world. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, okay, but my, my, so my successes are pretty small. <laughs> but I, I, will, I will tell a, a story about um, the medical school. And the medical school a few years ago, um, Dean, there was a survey and there was some unhappiness on, on the part of the women. And so the, the dean of the medical school uh, called together a meeting of the, the senior women faculty, which was a very small number. Uh, of women, by the way, um, and uh, want us to have us over, you know, ha meet over a dinner time. Um, again, I, whether that was the best time or not, you, you could sort of think through that for yourselves. Um, and there were many things that were discussed, and, and it, was, uh, it was a somewhat useful discussion, and I'll say it was useful because uh, it was a time that I got to see my peers, whom you never do see, right? Because you're in your own little world. Um, and so I made some good contacts uh, through that. However, after that meeting, um, the faculty women in my department said, you know, we should get together more often. And so we currently now meet monthly. And uh, we have taken upon ourselves to really promote one another. And I'm using the word promote. It's a, 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 a word I'm stealing from a faculty member in my department, Sherry Rose, rather than mentor, but promote. And we meet, and it, those meetings have been really useful. Sometimes it's not business. Most of the time it is, though. And uh, we do, I find, um, have a basis to discuss issues, to strategize uh, when um, there are uh, announcements for you know, awards. We make sure we write letters uh, for yeah. people. It, you know, it sounds small, and it, it sounds a little strange. But if you want to get ahead in today's success metrics, you need to do, the, do these types of things. And you know, for the committees that, that the medical school has, if we want to put people up, we have to do it. No one else is going to do it. We have to do it. So that's my, my yeah. um, it's uh, again, somewhat small, but I would say uh, very large in terms of benefit that I've had personally. Yeah. And I, I think as well, my colleagues would say they've benefited as well. Right. Thank you, Sharon. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it was small. I think it has been transformative for many people. Um, so one, one last question, because I want to make sure I have time for, I'm sure there would be a lot of people in, in the audience have questions. So I wanted to turn again to Consal and then Kathleen. And you know, just um, building on what 
what Sharon Lee is mentioning, because actually the, po the power of a network, both within a department, but also between departments and also between academia and the outside world. And so um, I think, you know, Consolda, you had, you know, you train at Harvard and then have such important career and impactful career, successful career in business. So what do you think could be examples of, you know, multi-stakeholder, because I think the multi-stakeholder models actually has a lot of potential good opportunity to think about data-driven solution for, for women in science? Um, it's a really, really important um, topic. And you talked a lot, Katja, about the networks around the researchers and how you think through how to tap into networks and put them in the right network. Um, and I think it does take a village for one to succeed. Right. And you need to build that village quite thoughtfully throughout your career. Um, and, and I'll tell you maybe personally, about sort of the way I've built networks. And I'd like to say I was very intelligent and thoughtful about it, but it was more chance and, and serendipity bringing networks together. Um, and I think one thing, especially women, um, sometimes are not as good at. So I've, I've been with Relix 15 years. I had two children while I was there. And I definitely didn't want to do the dinners <laughs> and the breakfast meetings. Um, and uh, honestly, my husband didn't either because we're a dual career couple. We were just exhausted. I, my second one didn't sleep through the night for four years. I will never forgive him for that. <laughs> so I think it's really, really important to figure out how you're going to build those networks in some non-traditional ways. Um, and I have built networks primarily through the work that I've done by um, going above and beyond whenever I could help colleagues, wherever I could support them. Uh, and that's part of who I am. It comes naturally to me. But that, over time, built a lot of natural networks for me, both within Relix, which I think has helped me come to the position that I have come in today, but also outside of Relix, too, because when you start connecting the dots, then people ask you actually to connect the dots for their networks as well. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there is this impact. And I find networks are most impactful when you're not focused on building a network but when you're actually focused on helping in a moment of need, and there's a real subsidence to it. So when I mentor people, um, I mentor a lot of people, I say, let's not have a catch up once a month. Call me when you need me. Call me when you had a really bad meeting and you're thinking through how you can do it better next time. Call me when you have an, and I will make the time, even if it's after dinner for 15 minutes over the phone, that is a more valuable connection than us having coffee once a month where really both of us have nothing to talk through so the relationship <laughs> falls apart because you're just trying to come up with, with subjects. So I think it's really important to build networks based on substance and in a moment of need. Talking about multi-stakeholder models, our business at Alsevier is very much a network business too. Right? We have publishers, we have peer reviewers, we have editors, and all of this has to come together for the researcher to make sure that the, the right um, articles get published and, 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 and the integrity is there. And if I look at, and this is what we're trying to do at Alsevier, is understand how much of, how many people get excluded because they're not part of that network, mm -hmm. and how can we systematically unlock those networks? Because I think the networks themselves don't even know that they're not including the right people because it just has a natural way and rhythm of working. But how do we uncover these networks? And I met some wonderful researchers my first week on the job. Um, and they, um, they, they were brought up in Africa, from diff in different countries in Africa. And when they told me what were obstacles for them, one of them was internet access. I mean, we would never even consider that in our business when we're evaluating uh, a piece of work. So you need to actually start understanding who you're excluding from your network due to things that you don't even think twice about. Um, one of my favorite, a friend of mine is the CEO of this non-for-profit that organizes camps um, for children uh, whose parents have cancer or have died of cancer. And she really struggled with diversity and inclusion, both with the camp attendees, it's free, and with also um, camp counselors. And, and she didn't discover what was going, it was such a simple thing. The application, the first question the application was, have you ever been to camp? 
well, if you're coming from an underprivileged background, you probably have not been to camp, and that was one of the criteria. To, so it's these simple things that we don't realize because we're in our own network and we take things for granted. So um, to come back to your question, Francesca, I think it's really important to build networks, build on substance, but then to be also very conscious of what you may be excluding because the network evolved naturally and try to systematically mm -hmm. eradicate that in your network. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It, it just, it, it thinks to, it, it, this speaks to me to one of the issues that actually in data science we have now with artificial intelligence and machine learning about reinforcing, reinforcing bias in a network. So. Unfortunately, if the data is biased, then the right. algorithms are biased as well. Um, and I know there's a lot of debate around is algorithms more biased than, than people? And I feel like, honestly, people are biased too. So what are we trying to solve here? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that could be a synergy of biases with <laughs> terrible consequences. So, but that's another, another panel. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn it to Kathleen. So when I think about multi-stakeholder models, when I was looking at questions ahead of time, I, I think of different universities as multiple stakeholders in this um, incredible endeavor of um, higher education. I got my MBA from Seattle University um, and my PhD from Northwestern. I'm now here at Harvard. These are really, really different schools. Um, we could, and, it, and it's fantastic that Seattle U is going back to, when I got my MBA, teaching was everything they emphasized, just the best teachers on earth. Um, and they moved away from that, and it's great to hear they're going back. Um, because data on, uh, this is an aside, but data on publications is way easier than data on teaching. Right? So, so if, if you can create a different kind of database that weights these different factors differently, then schools can choose. And, and what would be really helpful for schools, all of whom have a multi-dimensional and different model of the type of person they're looking for than the next school, um, we could use not the aggregated data that, that you've, we've talked about today, but Scopus disaggregated. So yep. it would be, so we just spent the last six months um, in one of our units looking to hire one senior economist because you had to somehow go out and scrape all the websites of all of the universities um, of all of the universities that are sort of considered top 50 universities in, in economics across the world, scrape all their senior faculty, do some coding to say are they in a, a field even closely resembling what this unit wants, et cetera, et cetera. Six months to get to that point. It would be incredible to have a searchable database that said, we want somebody um, that is in labor economics that studies um, gender and labor economics, that focuses on Southeast Asia, that um, has a very high teaching record, that has publications in, so this is HBS, so we care about impact on the world, so has publications in the um, non-academic sector as well. Um, and ideally, that has uh, you know, some uh, scope for integrating all of their work into the classroom. Now, there is no such database, but the data are there, right? Those data exist, but we simply can't search them with that. And if we could, we would come up with a very different top 10 than Seattle U would come up with. But both schools could do that in six days, agreeing on the criteria rather than six months. The other thing that that would do is it would force you to say what are, so this, this goes back to Sharon Lisa's point, what are our criteria? So what exactly are we looking for if it's not folks that got good letters from people that we know? Right, so that, those, that's our current criteria. Um, and, and that is simply a proxy for does really good work in areas that we care about. That, it's the best proxy we have, but the data are there. Scopus has those data, and it would be wonderful yeah. as uh, all the universities in the world would benefit from being able to search that at the scholar level. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's, I I'm think. I'm so glad I came. <laughs> they, yeah, Fantastic. they, I think, yes, yeah, so they do, so I can speak, and I will be, I should, I should turn it to Leslie, but they have the data and they have amazing matching algorithm. I mean, it will not be, again, you know, it's not going to be perfect, but it's much better than doing it by hand, and then you can, right? So, you want to say something, Leslie? 
I shouldn't speak. I shouldn't speak for Elsevier, but we love it. I'm already okay. glad we I came. It. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is a good time. I wanted to open for question to any of the panelists and comments and, and thoughts. Alisa. I have a data science question. Go for it. Is there a way to predict from the data what the human impressions will be? And is there a way to factor, not necessarily, you know, a voice network letters, but surveys about, you know, who are the most creative people in your field? Don't, don't go look at their citation history. Is there some way to factor that kind of information? Because I think a lot of times, I mean, um, we were hearing about networks and, you know, not having meetings that are regularly scheduled. And there's this kind of informal um, information and acknowledgement of what's valuable to people and who's valuable. And that doesn't get factored in typically in any of these things. And so I'm kind of curious how you compare these metrics in some way that might predict that or how you actually figure in the human opinions. Oh, sorry. Yes, I will. Um, <laughs> If we, I mean, with, 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 with technology where it is right now, if you can actually get, for example, aggregation of the letters, you can do quite a bit of analysis by extracting the sentiment and the words that was used to start predicting whether those were good hires or bad hires. You could do that. The technology is actually there or thereabouts right now. The issue which people always underestimate is actually the aggregation of the data or the keeping track of the data. And funders here can be really effective because usually if it's a, so we in publishing constantly debate whether we should mandate data submission with the articles. Uh, but we don't, I don't think we have the standing with the academic community to mandate something. I think that would backfire on us. We know it will be a good outcome in general for the academic community and the scientific community if all the data sets were available and then everybody could start crunching through the data sets. But it's very difficult, I think, for us as information analytics business to mandate things to our communities. So it needs to come from either you know, funders who do have the money. So there is actually, even though people may fuss about it, they, they feel obligated to, to do the uh, mandated activities to reach. So it, it all goes back to what are the right, and, and you can spend so much money trying to collect and aggregate data, and you can spend so much human time doing that as well. Um, so the best way that I think you can go about doing this is, again, pilots and experiments where you say, for one department, for five years, I'm going to commit to actually aggregating this data, and you have a data czar who is absolutely a policeman who will not let anyone get away without doing it. And we do that in our business when we're trying to aggregate different data sets. We put people in charge of really making sure the data is collected. Th that's, that's where the challenge is. I think we can crunch all kinds of data and content and text and sentiment with technology now, but the data is not always there. That's the issue. Thank you. I see Judy, and then I see I'll, I'll turn it to you. Judy. Uh, one of the questions that's not come up is research on the effects of the decision makers on the decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so certainly uh, <coughs> some of our assessments are quantitatively based, but a lot of them are not. And in fact, I would argue most of them shouldn't be. So the discussion of metrics is, is helpful, but also thinking about more qualitative uh, kinds of data. The evidence on whether the diversity of decision makers actually has an effect on outcomes is incredibly mixed. In fact, there are some studies that show uh, that increasing the diversity of review panels does not, in fact, increase the diversity of the outcomes. But it would be great to think about whether we could use some of these data to think about the effects of leadership, you know, journal editors at the top who make ultimate decisions when you've got two reviewers on each side and one person in the middle and somebody has to make that decision about whether to publish. In academia, the similar sorts of issues about search committees where half the committee ranks A first and B second, the other half ranks B first and uh, A second, and then everybody decides on C because that's the one who's everybody else's <laughs> uh, choice. Um, the composition of, uh, of reviewers, associated as the entire you know, pu publishing apparatus. And also not forgetting that 
men make a lot of decisions. Somebody pointed out this room is largely female, but thinking about male allies and not making the presumption that just because someone's a woman, she's going to be promoting women, and just yeah. because someone's a man, that uh, he's not going to be. Uh, so thinking about whether there are opportunities, you could imagine giving implicit association tests when you have to submit a paper to an Elsevier journal. Uh, <laughs> or if you sign up to be a reviewer, you have to do implicit bias training. Yeah. And those scores could be used as predictors mm -hmm. of outcomes over the long haul. Yeah. But these are all, all great ideas. And I think it is about um, which ones do we implement in which sequence. Um, I think there's something really powerful in what you said. It's not the metrics. It's also the judgment mm -hmm. of the people. And it, that has nothing to do with gender. You have uh, argued there are men who have been bigger promoters of women than women. And so that has nothing to do with gender. But how do we quantify that? And what I see, so we run 2,500 journals. And there's a lot of editorial independence. And we have to be respectful of that. Where I see um, the Nile move is when the leadership, the, the editor-in-chief, has commitment. That, to me, is the most important. When they care, because what we care about, we act on. Then they figure out a way to actually improve the diversity. Uh, but it's, it's how do we get people to care? <laughs> how do we get people to commit, uh, to prioritize this as, 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 as a key factor? What I have also seen. Um, is when you have a few that is really successful, and I suspect this will be at the university setting, then that's quite um, infectious. So it, success attracts success. So when you have stories of, of journals who've done, and Lancet does a great job here, and they do inspire a lot of our other journals in, in moving the dial, in making diversity and inclusion a cornerstone of the publishing process. Um, what I intend to do at Elsevier is we have gender working groups, as I said, around um, getting better balance in editorial reviews, getting better balance in peer review, uh, getting uh, more inclusive submissions process, understanding what is rejected, what's not. Um, I have actually recently made a decision. I will sit with that group every two weeks because I just want to show as the CEO I am committed to this. I don't think I'm necessarily going to add to their thinking, but it's just showing them I have your back, this is important work, and let's do it. And I think that takes commitment at the leadership level to drive forward. I, I think there is, and Judy, I think you know some of this work. So there is some research that speaks to this. Um, and Kamsal's first point, uh, or last point, is the first one, and that is um, the gender of the evaluator isn't a great predictor, but the gender diversity of the people above is a very good predictor. So, so you're much more likely, say, if you're a woman in a professional services firm to be promoted in a work unit that has senior partners who match um, your gender and race. So, so we do know that that matters even if the decision makers uh, per se don't matter. Um, the other, uh, so Mandy Palace, who's in our econ department, has some research that speak, is from my perspective the most illustrative in terms of the way implicit biases get in the way. And a quick and dirty of her research, she was studying, um, think grocery stores in France. Um, and they had trainees coming through um, all the time, and the trainees were both at the supervisor level and at the sort of store worker level. And what they found, they, they measured the implicit bias against um, uh, North Africans, which was the, the population um, that they were focusing on. So there were essentially white French and North African French. And what they found was that the supervisors who had higher bias, um, implicit bias, didn't do anything explicitly differently. They just avoided the people. They didn't give them the extra work. They didn't give them the extra assignments. They, it, it was almost like they didn't pick on them. Um, and, and we know from other research on negative feedback that people are more likely to give negative feedback to people who are like themselves. Um, because you're more comfortable saying to somebody whom you know the relationship is sound, you know, when you gave that speech, you had a whole bunch of hesitations, let's work on it. Whereas if it's someone you're not comfortable with, you just let it go, great speech. So, so um, I think those three areas of research are telling in terms of who the decision makers are matters, but not in ways that are so um, easily uh, 
uh, manipulated as, okay, we'll put three women on this committee and two women on this committee. So, so from advance, um, this is one of the main focuses is the looking at how those decisions are allowed to be made in terms of the policies and processes you have in place for your search committee or your whatever committee. <clears throat> if you ever have a, a committee where the chair does the preliminary sort of CVs, you've already introduced extreme biases um, for the yes, no pocket piles, right? Um, so you can't have a situation where there's only one person doing that sort, whether or not they're a man or a woman, whether or not they've had implicit bias training, et cetera. So part of your um, intervention is to look at how you go about making decisions um, and who as an individual are making those decisions if you, if you can, cannot create the structure to mitigate that individual's decision making influence, um, then you need to work with that individual to give them tools and strategies to mitigate their implicit biases in their decision making. So having the data alone is absolutely 100% not enough uh, for, for decision makers. Um, it's an important step because you need that in order to know where your issues are, um, but it, it is absolutely not, not the end of the solutions. You still need to create the systems, you need to train people and empower them to do the right thing. Um, and, and then have the carrots and sticks that are appropriate to reward um, when they do a good job and to, to let them know when they're not. Yeah. Thank you. We are close to end of the session, so I want to get the well, last question. So what's the call to action? So what can we, as lowly scientists <laughs> with a lot less influence than the panel, mm -hmm. do on a daily basis to start changing the scale? And I'm thinking something like me too, right? Tremendous power and it was essentially millions of, of, of women coming forward. I'll start off by saying don't characterize yourself as that way. <laughs> So that's that you know that's that's number one. You're you're, you're powerful. You, you, yeah. <laughs> so you know, and I, I don't mean that to, so you, we could have a little giggle. Uh, it, you know, again, you're you're important. You've got um, science. Uh, you've got uh, you've got uh, uh, talent. Uh, your input is critical. So okay, I know that's not what you are after, but that's sort of the the first thing um, that I would say. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, others will, will obviously uh, have a sage advice. Uh, mine is, you know, get your network together. That is so important uh, as, a, as a junior person. Have a network. If you don't have one, start with one person. Talk to people here. Uh, you know, you need that network. Can I also... Uh, from the advanced community, Virginia Valian at um, Hunter College has a website called Gender Equity Project, and there's um, checklists or kind of guides for individuals who are interested in making changes and, and progressing on equity for chairs and for other leaders. So you can download those and get yourself some ideas, but basically it's about being an advocate um, for when things are not going right in your meetings uh, based on your where you're at. So if you're assistant faculty, that's where you're at, so um, you don't necessarily correct the senior faculty, but you might do something else in a meeting. Uh, you might say, I think that she has already said that um, earlier. <laughs> um, those kinds of things, those kinds of strategies, as, and you can learn those over time as an individual. And then as you become chair and as you become dean, um, there's a whole set of other strategies you can take with you. Yes, all the way up, yes. And, and opt in and have faith going back to the progress women made over 50 years. I mean, this is a journey, and we're going to get there, and we're going to get there by collectively working on it every single day. So just opt in and make sure you stand up and you challenge and you figure out new ideas and you push the dial forward. I think, I, I think data are big here. So uh, whenever you're involved in a decision, ask for the data. Don't let a conversation go, well, you know, she really didn't. And if, if, if you're in a conversation where somebody says something about fit, <laughs> um, ask them to define that. What is fit, ha what, are we, what criteria are we talking about here? And let's get the data to see whether this person or this person fits those criteria as opposed to is a good fit. So when you hear these words that are, that are um, proxy for people like me, and fit is one of them, 
stop that discussion and ask for data. Ask for criteria, ask for data, and insist on decision making, evaluation, feedback, choice of whom to work with, et cetera, to be based on criteria and data as opposed to these nebulous concepts that allow us to continue the um, discrimination unchecked. And I've got one other thought. I hope that by coming here today, there's an amazing ability in this room. I hope you've talked to two people today that you didn't meet before you came into this room, because that would be a hell of a start. Just imagine if everyone in this room did that. We've built a network just in the afternoon. And if I can jump in and uh, just share some advice that was shared with me early on in my career. When you're given feedback throughout, I always ask for feedback, but then ask for what is my yes but? Because you usually don't hear the but until it's a promotion point. So people don't want to discourage you. They'll say, yes, you're great at this, you're great at that, da 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 But you always push, but what's my but? When you're in that room and there's a promotion discussion, people are going to say she is great X, Y, and Z, but. Find out your butts early on in your career and always ask for them and then address them, whether they're perception or reality, you need to address the butts. <laughs> well, I know that you know, we could go here from, for hours and have with so many other questions and I have the terrible job now closing the session. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna have a little bit of break so you can definitely approach um, any of our uh, member of the panel. And I wanna thank the panelists for such a wonderful, thoughtful, conversation and I want to thank you all for uh, for joining us and hopefully this is just the beginning of a broader conversation about data qualitative data and advice for students and junior faculty on moving forward so thank you <laughs> <laughs>